with the second part of the first lecture by Ipanta. Okay, so let us start. So in the first part of this uh, today's lecture, I had discussed the classical mechanical Tung's gas and the gas with nearest neighbor coupling, which is called a Takahashi gas. And now we will like to discuss what happens to this problem if you introduce quantum mechanics. So I call it quantum mechanical Tung's gas. So the Hamiltonian is equal to the kinetic energy. V of x So the key point, which is the difference from the previous problem, is that now we cannot separate away the momenta. Momenta and positions are coupled by quantum mechanics, either by the uncertainty principle, or uh, you know, you cannot. Um, I cannot just do this problem. I have to put p squared. Okay, so we will try to do this. We'll take the same um, old system in which you have a total system of length l and you will have n particles which are looking like this of width sigma and now each of these is a quantum mechanical particle and uh, we want to study this system. I guess in the beginning we just want to find the eigenstates of energy, diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Okay, Once we have diagonalized the Hamiltonian will sum up over all the energy states that will give the partition function and then if you have energy left you can try to calculate the correlation functions of this system. Okay. Um, so this problem is actually quite hard and let us discuss n equal to one case. That is actually rather easy and I can do this one here. So there is a single particle. And it moves in a potential. The potential is provided by its interaction with the wall. So actually it can only move from sigma by 2 to L minus sigma by 2. Okay. So and there is a wave function psi of x um, minus d square h cross is set equal to 1 m psi equal to e psi and um, e psi of x and uh, x lies between sigma by 2 and L minus sigma by 2 and psi of x equal to 0 at boundaries of this interval. So that is well, is well studied and well known, all the answers are known, it is given in shift. Uh, the nth energy level has energy n squared h cross squared by 2m, I think there is a pi squared and then there is a L minus sigma squared. Okay, And the corresponding wave function. equal to sine uh, let's call it k, k n pi x minus sigma by 2 normalization and k 
kn squared h cross squared by 2m equal to k squared h cross squared equal to n squared. Pi. Pi should be absorbed in the K. I think this looks good. Okay, so one particle problem has been solved. That is rather straightforward. And now we'll try to do the n equal to 2 case, which as you will see is already quite complicated. Okay, so n equal to 2, what's my state space? The same as what we discussed last time, it looks like this. The forbidden region, x1, this is x2, this is allowed. Allowed. Then there is all these are forbidden outside. Okay, again, there is a wave function psi of x1, x2, and it satisfies minus d squared by dx1 squared 2 minus d squared by dx2 squared. M sorry e times psi x one x two and uh, the wave function has to vanish it's inside these regions where it's, in the, it's forbidden and so it should also vanish at the boundaries of the regions. Okay, bigger. And psi x1 x2 equal to 0 at boundaries. So, can I solve this problem? So, the first thing to notice is that. The solution here will always be degenerate because the wave function can be here or here, but I can certainly construct a wave function which is psi 1 of x1, x2, which is non zero in top triangle and zero in the lower triangle. And of course, psi 2 can be done with the other way, no? Opposite. These two are linearly, clearly linearly independent solutions because they don't even have any overlap. Okay? So, a general solution can be a linear combination of these ones. I should solve the problem in one triangle. Then I'm kind of happy. Okay, so given give or take a little bit, the triangle looks like this, and I want to solve the del squared phi Laplace's equation in this triangle with the wave boundary condition zero at the boundary. Okay, now it turns out 
that this is sort of a generally a hard problem. There are a lot of people who spend a lot of time studying the billiards problem, which is you take some funny boundary shape and you discuss the solutions of the um, Laplace's equation on with that boundary. Okay, all the different eigenfunctions. And they show very complicated and difficult behavior. Uh, we are not worried about the most general boundary condition, but with this rather stupid boundary condition of a right triangle. Uh, for the sake of my discussion just now, it is useful to consider M1, M2 here. M1, M2 are two masses of two different particles, right? In classical statistical mechanics, M1, M2 didn't show up in the Tonks gas problem because they came in the part of the momentum integral and it was, you know, it was a multiplicative factor which was thrown out. In the configurational integral, M1, M2 were not there. In the quantum mechanical problem, M1, M2 have to be there because they determine a coefficient um, between these two. You cannot get rid of them. If they are not equal, that problem is not the same as if they are equal. You can scale M2, you can scale X2 to make M1, M2 equal, but then the triangle becomes uh, a right angle triangle, but not an isosceles triangle. Now it turns out that this problem, when the triangle is unequal in size, cannot be solved in closed form easily. Even this simple problem has not been solved in closed form. Of course, there are solutions, they exist numerically, you can determine them. But there is no simple expression for En as a function of N and the corresponding wave function psi N. They cannot be written in terms of, are not explicitly known. functions. So what is meant by explicitly known? These things, this, is, this is an important point. We have defined the problem. It is well defined. Psi n is the nth eigenfunction of this particular shape. So that is the definition. It is well defined. Um, why is that not good enough for everybody? No, some people are much happier if psi n can be written as an elliptic function of x1 times some um, other function of x2 and some complicated integral thereof. Okay, so that is called an explicit representation of psi. But just saying that psi is the nth eigenfunction of this shape, is that not an explicit representation of psi? I think it's equally good. In fact, it is not known that you can write this for general shape, even as, as simple a shape as a square. It turns out that if these two sides, A and B, are rational multiples of each other, then in some lucky cases, you can determine the solution. But some of the solutions, not all of them, you can write down an eigenfunction which will actually work. We will write down some of them. And, but they don't exhaust all the eigenfunctions of the system. So that is a problem. But the case where A equal to B is a lucky case. And there we can get actually all the eigenfunctions exactly. So that's what we do next. Okay. Sorry, there is a explicitly known for all n for all a by b. Okay, so we take the case a equal to b. And then I construct a solution. So the answer comes through some trick. 
which of course is hard to realize, but it's easy to teach. Like I mean, if I were to discover it on my own, it will be very hard. I may not get it for five years. But if I tell you now, then in five minutes you know the answer. Okay? So the trick is the following. We want to solve the problem in this triangle. We don't do that. We solve it in the full square, which is obtained by reflecting the triangle about its diagonal. And then uh, choose the functions which are odd under reflection in this. All the functions of psi which I can write down, there are finite set of eigenfunctions which actually have the symmetry that they are odd under this thing. Okay, so then I work with them. That is the answer. So, so A equal to B, the solution is psi m n is equal to sin m pi x1 over A sin n pi x2 over A. This is the solution on the full square, but I just make an anti symmetric combination. Sin n pi x1 over a sin m pi x2 over a, and I can normalize it. Okay. If I look at just the first term, this is an eigenfunction of del squared x1, this is an eigenfunction of del squared x2, the product is an eigenfunction of del squared x1 plus x2. The eigenvalue is m squared plus n squared up to multiplicative constants. The same thing is true for this one with the same eigenvalue. Okay? So, if I make this combination, then of course the linear combination also is an eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue. But this one has the additional property that if x1 equal to x2, it has to vanish. So, on this line, sorry, um, one, two, I just flipped my directions. On the line x1 equal to x2, the wave function vanishes. Okay. Then I can go back to my original problem by introducing these shifts you know, by sigma and so on. That is not a problem. That I will not write down the solutions here. Is that clear? I have, once I have solved the problem on this equilateral, sorry, right triangle, isosceles right triangle, then I have solved the problem for two particles with equal masses. Okay, so that is the solution. Uh, hmm. But this is odd under symmetry. So I will write here four x one x two belonging to top triangle. And the corresponding eigenvalue is E M N is equal to m squared plus n squared times some constant. I can write down these constants, but I'm deliberately not writing them because it's not necessary for understanding what is going on. When, if you get written notes of these lectures, which I will actually not write, but I could have written, then all the factors of h cross and m and pi will be there. Or you can provide them yourself. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so we are discussing the fact that this solution psi 1 as written here, here and psi 2 are both of them valid quantum mechanical solutions. If you start with a wave function which is non-zero here some wave function and evolve it in time using Schrodinger's equation. It will remain in that triangle. It cannot escape out of there. And the solution in the second will remain zero. 
Okay? So that is just saying that you can exchange. So there are these sectors x1 less than x2 is a dynamical sector in which the particle stays. If you put it initially there, it remains there throughout its life. And if you choose the other one, then the system will stay in that sector throughout. And these two are not connected to each other. So if you want, you can ignore one of them. If you want, I can say that, oh, the particles are identical. Then I cannot say which one is one, which one is two. Indistinguishable. Indistinguishable particles. Then I can say by convention, in this case, it is correct that psi x1, x2 will be equal to psi x2, x1. We may choose. So under exchange, we can, since in this case the two sectors do not communicate with each other, I am allowed to do whatever I like. I, in particular, I can choose them to be psi x1, x2 equal to psi x2, x1. Then the wave function is symmetric under exchange of particles. And these particles are called bosons, or vice versa. If the particles are Bose particles, then the wave function has to be symmetric. On the other hand, I can choose psi x1, x2 equal to minus sine. And then I will say these particles are fermions. Okay? And uh, the particles, perhaps in this case, don't care. And they will remain the same, whether you call them bosons or fermions. Because according to the interaction given, they actually cannot exchange places. So what happens when they exchange places? You know, will the wave function change sign or not change sign? Is a known question. That is an important point to realize. The more detailed way of saying this is that in one dimension, the bosons and fermions are the same thing. There is no distinction between them if they are hardcore. Okay. So now we come to the case n equal to 3 and luckily that is rather easy. So for n less than x2, so now it is actually fairly straightforward. The equation I will write will be d squared x1 squared minus d squared x2 squared minus d squared x3 squared, sorry, minus psi x1, x2, x3, xn equal to e times psi x1, x2, then the, system, the phase space, configuration space will be a generalized pyramid. You know you will have directions x1, x2, x3, x4, each of them is positive and there is a condition x1 plus x2 plus x3. Okay. So, what we did here with triangle in the 3D, it looks like this. You know, there is an x1, x2, x3, and there is a cut which uh, gives you a pyramid. Non trivial to think of this in the three dimensional space, but I encourage you to try to do it. Then you will see that this is the configuration space, and then there are other copies of this which you can. 
put x2 less than x1 will give you the same figure, but rotated and put in space, you know. And if you put six of them together, I get you get the whole cube. The cube can be decomposed into six, six such figures. And uh, we solve for one of them and put the wave function zero at the boundary. And the way to do it is to put psi of x1, x2, xn equal to determinant of sine k1, x1, sine k2, x2, sine kn, xn with ki, xi, ki, l equal to ni pi. Put all ni distinct, otherwise you won't get a non-trivial wave function. And that is like the fermion condition. Okay, so the, all the ni should be distinct and then this provides the solution. And uh, if you want boson wave function, psi Fermi is equal to free particle wave function. Sorry? Yeah, it's a square matrix, n by n. Ah, it is sine k1 x2. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I wrote it wrong. This is k1 x1, k1 xn. Thank you. k2 x1, sine k2 x2. This is the so-called Slater determinant, sine k2 xn, like that. So sine ki xj would be the generic term. Yes. That is correct. No, you are right. So in going from here to here, the change from x to delta was made. OK? And so psi Bose is equal to mod value of psi Fermi. So if you go to a different sector, the boson wave function will be symmetrical. OK, so now, so what have we learned with this exercise? We can determine all the eigenfunctions of the quantum mechanical Tung's gas with n particles if the masses are equal. So we just did it. Now, what is the partition function? Partition function is the same as the partition function of an ideal Fermi gas, which you have studied in your BSc. Because the energy levels are the same. Each allowed energy level of an ideal Fermi gas gives you an energy level for this system. So did I work out the partition function of an ideal Fermi gas? No, didn't. And usually what people do is they say that um, we will work in the grand canonical ensemble and calculate the grand partition function that's easier to do. And then if you really want to do it, you know, you, you take the nth coefficient by doing some contour integral, but it is not done or it again, the final answer cannot always be written in closed form for the partition function. For the grand partition function, there is a nicer simple product form representation. Okay? But that is not my concern now. Um, hmm. So this issue about different masses behaving differently than equal masses is sort of an interesting question. And uh, there have been a lot of studies in literature. You take a one-dimensional line put particles with different masses, m1, m2, m, randomly selected. You know, you, you can take two masses, but each mass can take 
to possible values. Sorry, you can take particles where each particle has one of the two possible masses and you make a line and then give them some initial velocity, let them collide and see what happens. Okay. Turns out all kinds of crazy things happen and people keep on studying this for a long time and they cannot figure out. All the masses are equal, then the behavior is kind of very simple. When two collisions occur, the velocities are exchanged. Okay. And so that problem can be studied or understood. Uh, when the masses are unequal, that doesn't work. And so all this stuff will not work if the masses are unequal. Okay, so I don't know what happens to the Tong's gas with unequal masses. Somebody might guess that no, 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 all these equivalences to free fermions, etc., are going to be valid still. But that is the um, hope. It doesn't seem to explicitly work out. Okay, so um, I only indicate the fact that A, that different masses uh, makes the problem much more complicated in quantum mechanics. And secondly, the connection between the equilibrium stat mech and these dynamical simulations in which particles collide and see what happens at long times is also an issue because you know whether equilibrium is reached or not reached <coughs> becomes a question. If you have funny boundary conditions like this part is at a higher temperature than this part, then all kinds of ex extra stuff happens which I will not discuss. But yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, no, so it is correct. I, uh, I don't know what symmetry is broken. Yeah, the masses are not equal. So the symmetry between two particles is broken. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I don't know what is the consequence of which one, which comes first. The symmetry breaking comes first or the name. You invent a symmetry when it is there, when it is not there, then you first imagine some symmetry and then it is broken. Okay. When I stated the problem to begin with, there was no symmetry, then it's not there. No? So I think it uh, displays a mindset by saying some symmetry is broken because it was not there. Okay, so now I still have some time and so what should I do in the remaining time? What we will do is to calculate some correlation functions of the Tung's gas. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, so the problem was well defined. There will be, uh, the original problem was A equal to B. You know, that was how the problem was posed. But the coefficient D squared by DX1 squared has a different coefficient than D squared by DX2 squared, which you can rescale to convert to a problem in which the sides are unequal length, but the Laplace operator is, dis, you know, with D squared by DX1 squared plus D squared by DX2 squared with equal coefficients. Okay, and I'm saying that that problem cannot be solved completely in closed form already. Even that stupid simple problem with two particles, right triangle, what is the wave function? I cannot do it in closed form. Okay, okay, so now. So incidentally, once I have said that the partition function is the same as that of free ideal gas, 
I can take the thermodynamic limit, I can see how the specific heat varies at low temperature for an ideal Fermi gas in one dimension. Anybody remembers the answer? Sorry? Yeah. Linearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in, in all these systems, the uh, Fermi systems, there is a um, Fermi liquid theory, and it, you, this stuff will satisfy the Fermi liquid theory assumptions, and everything will vary as pre predicted, calculated by Fermi. Okay? All right. So let me again define the problem. So we have the um, system of size L. There are n particles of size sigma. And what I like to calculate is the mutual correlation between these positions of these particles. So there is this stuff which is called the two-point correlation function, rho 2, r1, r2, equal to r1, ah, x1, x2. x1, dx2 is equal to probability of finding one particle particle between x1 and x1 plus dx1 and one particle between oh, maybe r1 r2 was better x and y because we have used x1, x2 as the coordinates of the particles and these are not the coordinates of the particle. x plus dx and y and y plus dy. So I take this line, I pick a point x and pick a point y and make a tiny window around this or with dx, dy. And I guess, you know, what is the probability that the center of one of the particles will lie in this window and another here. And I don't care where other particles are. Okay? The key point is that I'm only asking what the probability of finding some one particle here and one particle here. And I don't care what happens to the rest. Okay? So, this I hope to compute, but without calculating it, can I sort of guess what this function does? Rho 2 of x, y will be equal to rho 2 of x minus y away from boundaries. Or large n okay so I take the limit of system size becoming very large and the density remains finite then I ask this question then the answer only depends on the distance between x and y it does not depend on the precise position of where I take x and y because we will have translational invariance in the system maybe I have I have not established, I haven't shown this, but is this convincing enough for all of you? This argument that the two-point correlation function will only depend on the distance between the points, so long as the points are away from the boundary, is a good behavior condition. 
which we expect will hold unless something awful happens and in my system that awful thing is not happening. It is a good system. So, this will hold. So, this is a function of single variable and what is that? Can I plot this function rho 2 as a function of x minus y mod space? Mm, yeah, ok space. Mm, well, let us write x minus y. So, at 0 there is a little bit of a problem because same particle may come twice, no? So, let us not worry about 0, but uh, what what is the probability that very close to 0 here? What is rho 2 when x minus y is very tiny, let us say sigma by 10? 0 precisely all the way up to distance equal to sigma, this is going to be 0. And of course, same thing on this side. Then it will have some non zero value, it will do something. When x minus y is very large, we expect this to become equal to rho squared, which is the mean, you know, each, these particles will be independent and it tends to rho squared, which is the mean density squared. Again, I have not proved this one, but is this obvious? or you do not need a proof, you can prove it yourself going after going home or some such thing. Or we do not need a proof, we believe it anyway. Okay. So, very good. Uh, no, so, now I want to sort of be able to guess the general structure of this without doing the calculation and then maybe when we will actually do the calculation later. So, It turns out, we will show this eventually, but you know, even if you do not follow the um, details of the algebra later, this point should be clear. We will find that rho has a very interesting structure. It is 0 up to here, then it shoots up to a very largish value, and then it kind of goes down like this, and then shoots up, and goes down like this, and then it goes down maybe uh, and tends to an asymptotic value. Where, why does this bump occur uh, precisely at sigma? Because, you know, you have put n particles, so the mean density is rho but you have removed in particles cannot be here. So, the n minus 1 particles have to be in the rest. So, the some bumps have to occur, but suppose there is a particle here, then again in very close to it other particle cannot occur. And so, there is a dip. And so, this argument very qualitative works even in three dimensional hard spheres. So, the correlation function in 3D will have roughly this behavior, not exactly this, but of this sort, uh, which is that there is a region where it is 0, then there is a peak, which is called the first shell, and then there is a dip, and there is a second shell, and there is a dip, and there is a third shell, fourth shell, and after four shells you cannot see much, because it becomes the g, this function is different from 0, but not very different from, so, sorry, the Correlation function is different from rho squared, but not very different. It kind of asymptotes to a constant value. Okay. Now, this phenomenology can be qualitatively understood in as many words as I said just now. But the advantage of the Tonks gas is that we can actually calculate this function rho 2 exactly in this problem, which you cannot do in most other problems um, in StatMag. Okay, even for the 2D Ising model, rho 2 cannot be calculated. 
not in this way because you know um, Ising model can only be solved at h equal to zero, and we need uh, we need to work with fine uh, variable density and stuff like this. So uh, it will be an exaggeration, but let me make it. Um, it will be um, only a finite number of cases are known where you can actually calculate the correlation function exactly. This road two, and so this is one of them. I'm sure you can come up to me and say there is another one. Yeah, there are some are more, but this is one of the few cases which can be done, and it can be done in 15 minutes. So, <laughs> so that's an extra advantage. Okay, so I'll calculate the correlation function for this road two uh, in the next few minutes, 15. Yes. Yes. Ha, ah, so there is the mean spacing between particles. Uh, so uh, they actually correspond only to sigma, but the healing length corresponds to rho. And the rate at which these things die down like this or like this, they correspond to the mean density. Okay, so I want to calculate this function, probability that there is a particle particle between R and R plus dr given so how is this different from this I have shifted the origin that is one thing I have done and this is a conditional probability. So there is, it divides by rho. When r goes to infinity, this function will go to rho, while the other function went to rho squared. Okay, is this point clear? Okay, so now, equal to what? This is what we want to determine. And the key to the solution is the fact that the variables delta i are nearly uncorrelated variables. And in the thermodynamic limit, they become uncorrelated variables. Okay? Said another way, in the constant pressure ensemble, which is we introduced last time, they are independent variables. So I will study this problem in the constant pressure ensemble where life is easier. So in constant pressure ensemble, Delta I are independent I I D okay. Now what is the distribution of delta I? Because they are independent variables, in our problem, it was just, I forgot the answer. Somebody can help me with this. What is the distribution of delta i? Mm, it's a, so probability of delta i, 
I guess, looks like this. It is, it's expo shifted exponential. It's 0 up to something, and after that, there is an exponential minus beta p delta i, which is in the distribution function. So it is e to the power minus beta p delta i minus sigma. That is the function, and there is some value here, and there is some normalization. I will not do. Okay. Uh, so, so this quantity is equal to well. Uh, suppose there is in our problem there is one particle here, and I'm asking what the probability that the second particle is here. Then the answer is zero. You cannot have it. So. I guess my r should be bigger than sigma, otherwise the answer is 0. Suppose r is bigger than sigma, but it is less than 2 sigma, then there cannot be any other particle between them. Then delta i is equal to r. That is the probability, it must be, there is nothing else that can happen. Okay? So, this probability is equal to probability that delta 1 equal to r. The full answer. Good. But this answer is valid only if r lies between sigma and 2 sigma. Suppose r is a little bit bigger, bigger than 2 sigma. Then it is possible that delta 1 equal to r. But it's possible delta 1 is not bigger than r, but there is one more particle in there. Okay? So I should add to this plus probability that delta 1 plus delta 2 equal to r minus sigma. And probability that delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3 is equal to r minus 2 sigma and terms like that. Okay. So, the first one is very simple that was this result which we drew it is a something like this. What is this thing? Delta 1 and delta 2 both are exponentially distributed distributions. What is the distribution of delta 1 plus delta 2? So, that is easy that is uh, if x and y have distribution which is p of x is equal to e to the power minus x, then p of x plus y is equal to x e to the power minus x. Is equal, uh, x plus y equal to alpha is equal to alpha e to the power minus alpha. Because you take two exponentials and you have to integrate along the diagonal that gives you one factor x. Mm. x sorry x and y this is the function is e to the power minus x minus y and the positive quadrant. Then I want to determine the probability that x plus y equal to a given number then I have to integrate along this line. But along this line, this function is a constant. So, the length of the line comes, which gives you a factor proportional to the value. This is x plus y equal to s. So, there is an extra s which comes here and that gives me the term. Okay. So, this um, looks like s e to the power minus s and this term by the same argument. Now, there are three terms, but they have to add up to r minus 2 sigma. Then I have to do this in three dimensions. Same thing, but now the cut is two dimensional, is proportional to s squared. Okay. Um, so, the answer will be s squared e to the power minus s, mm, give or take a little bit. Okay. So, now let me write it in gory detail just to show that I was not cheating. 
this is equal to exponential minus r minus sigma theta of sigma minus r. This ensures that this term does not contribute when sigma r is less than sigma. Okay? Then I will write the second term plus, but I will write r minus 2 sigma minus r. Sorry, I beg your pardon, it is r minus sigma, not sigma, r minus sigma, this is r minus 2 sigma. And this term is actually s minus r minus 2 sigma whole um, time e to the power minus r minus 2 sigma p beta p beta sorry bigger okay yeah bigger <coughs> This part is visible, it, is, so it was too small. This is the last equation I will write. So, e to the power minus r minus, let me write r minus sigma theta of r minus sigma. And let me call it p tilde, which is beta p plus theta of r minus 2 sigma then there is an r minus 2 sigma e to the power minus p tilde of r minus 2 sigma. Oh, I did not write it much small, bigger. r minus 2 sigma exponential minus p tilde of r minus 2 sigma plus theta of r minus 3 sigma, r minus 3 sigma squared exponential of the same thing, minus p tilde r minus 3 sigma and so on. Uh, yeah, this is, looks right. It is actually still wrong. Uh, there are some factors which will come here to properly normalize this stuff. I can do that. You know, it's not a problem. I can f put in all the algebra, but the key point was to make you realize that this problem can be done. Tracking those factors is, is straightforward. And uh, my time is up, so I don't want to do, do it here. If I concentrated on fixing all the factors in all, all these formulas, then the key point would not have been conveyed. Okay? So I will stop here. <laughs>